capnography reflects physiology. Yes, it does. So that really, I mean, I think we're, we really came up with these. They're rolling right together that the picture that gives is important and it really tells us a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, we all know shark fin, right? That was the question on one national registry test somewhere, or maybe one of those limmer, uh, test prep question apps I was taking, you know, shark fins everywhere, right? Somebody has a tattoo of cap, no equal shark fin somewhere. It's probably Todd Breland. Um, but everybody knows capnography for dead people. Keep it above 10 for manual compressions, above 20 for mechanical compressions. An elevation of end tidal CO2 means you potentially have return of spontaneous circulation. That is so cool. There is so much more. So if we go back to the basics of how our body is functioning, the Krebs cycle, which if anybody on this podcast can draw the Krebs cycle out to scale, um, we have to have a serious conversation because I'm, I don't know that I'm going to hang out with that person, but I'm pretty impressed. Um, It'll take my I, job probably. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Usually when I talk about Krebs cycle or meet anybody with the last name Krebs, everybody kind of walks the other way. But if you take cellular metabolism and you go back to, I know what I was taught. CO2 is a byproduct of metabolism. It's actually not true. The byproduct of metabolism is hydrogen ions. That's one of the bad pro um, byproducts. ATP is the good stuff, right? Mm -hmm. It's the free floating bicarbonate from our kidneys. When you and I are done, we're going to stand up. We're going to recruit more muscle groups. Our kidneys will have released some bicarbonate. It's going to bind with those hydrogen ions and it's going to make water H2O and CO2. When we do that, and you see this really on the treadmill, right? You enhance your metabolism, you generate more hydrogen ion uh, binding with bicarb, you breathe faster to blow off the CO2, right? It's just chemistry. So if you have good metabolism, you have good carbon dioxide levels, 35 to 45, which just so happens to correlate with the blood pH, 7.35 to 7.45. And the yeah. same end tidal level is good for any mammal on earth. So I had a vet tech tell me that at one time they use it heavy in the veterinary community. So whether you're a one minute old, a hundred year old or a platypus, 35 to 45 is wow. your value. All yeah, right. That's... there's your there's your bar bar uh, topic tonight. Uh, <laughs> when Stephanie asks you a question, be like, hey, what's the end title range for a platypus? Uh, so when you take the physiology of it, just by nature of the value range, and correlate it to the patient assessment, you can use it as a driver for metabolism, which, which we'll talk about. Now, let's say that you, you are under perfusing. So you have decreased blood flow, oxygenated blood flow to your tissues. They have decreased metabolism or maybe anaerobic metabolism, and they have decreased return back to the lungs. Well, what's that going to do? If you have normally 200 obstructs or FedEx, I don't have any investment in either of those, that go out to the tissues the factory makes the production and 200 ups or FedEx trucks bring them back to the lungs. Normally 35 to 45, you have reduced cardiac output. Your heart rate's low. You're, you're dehydrated. Your cardiogenic shock, you're septic. You're going to have less trucks out, less trucks up. Your value is going to go down. But if I volume resuscitate you and enhance your end organ perfusion and drive that therapy, I'm going to climb your entitled CO2 up. Hence the ROSC situation. You're dead. No metabolic output. I'm pushing, trying to build that ATP through my manual compressions. Your 10 goes to 70 because you've restored underlying perfusion. You've now delivered delivery trucks to the areas that were under or non-perfused. And now they're bringing those products, those Amazon packages back up and delivering into the door of your lungs. So you get a spike. One thing I want to note on that, do not power bag them down. Allow that normal ROSC wash to come back. They were in a shock state before. They had areas of reduced perfusion. You're just washing those areas up and out, that byproduct of pre-death. I say that because what people tend to do is they get hyper fixated on the 35 to 45. You get a post-ROSC patient or you get a ROSC patient and it spikes up to 70, 80, 100. And they're like, oh, crap. And they want to power bag them down, increasing thoracic volume, dampening the vena cava and reducing perfusion. And so you're actually going to make your save a loss if you do that. Just allow it to wash out. Give it a couple minutes, four, five, six minutes. It's perfectly fine. Patient supine, reduced workload. Let the body do what the body does well. But use your capnography as your marker for your therapy progression. If after five minutes, there's no change, you've done your 15 lead EKG, and you're like, look, the, the perfusion is not coming up, 
then you get a little more aggressive with your fluids, a little bit more aggressive with your pressors. But you're using capnography as your dynamic driver for those therapies and those trigger points or those off the deck points. I love capnography for the you're sick as hell. We're not going anywhere. I found you sitting in your chair in your office in Kinnebunk, Maine, and your end title's 28, your heart rate's 130. I'm going to treat you where you are until I get your end title 33 or 34, and I get you mentating better and feeling better and your heart rate down. Those two are my drivers for hold or fold. So we used to always say, like, uh, was it load and go, stay and play? Mine is hold and fold. Are we going to hold where we're at? Or are we going to fold and get off the deck, right? So 